So Mark, let's let's talk about the role of uh, TDM1, adotrastuzumab and tanzine uh, in advanced HER2 positive uh, breast cancer. Well, you know, it's been quite a while since the FDA approval of the Amelia Pivotal trial, the randomized phase three study comparing TDM1 head to head against capecitabine and lapatinib um, in patients who had had prior taxane and trastuzumab. And uh, TDM1, as a result of that published data, has been considered the go-to second line agent following a Cleopatra-like regimen now for the past uh, several years. Uh, in the Amelia trial, which was uh, 991 patients, uh, the objective, objective response rate in the TDM1 arm was about 43.6%. So that was higher than the control arm of about 31%. And the median duration of response was over a year in the TDM1 arm versus about six and a half months in the control arm. Moreover, in our uh, final overall uh, survival analysis that was published in Lancet Oncology back in 2017, the median overall survival was also longer with TDM1 compared to control, 29.9 months versus 25.9 months. The hazard ratio is 0.75. And that's despite the fact that 27% of the patients actually crossed over from the control capelopatinib arm over to TDM1 uh, during the course of their uh, treatment. Um, the other data set in terms of just looking at expected response rates uh, is the TERESA trial. This is a phase three trial in more heavily pretreated uh, HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer patients who had had two or more prior lines of HER2 targeted therapy uh, as an eligibility criteria. And in that study, um, there was a significant improvement in progression-free survival favoring uh, TDM1 as compared of, to a control arm, which was treatment of physician's choice, which was essentially chemo du jour, uh, along with trastuzumab for most of the patients. And the hazard ratio favoring TDM1 was about a half with high statistical confidence. Overall survival was significantly longer with TDM1 versus uh, treatment of physician's choice as well, uh, over 22 months versus about 16 months for the control arm. And that difference was statistically significant. And the response rate in the case of TDM1 in this more heavily pretreated population was 31.3% versus 8.6% for control. So um, both of these set the stage for the approval of TDM1 and its uh, kind of um, place in the landscape of treating HER2 positive metastatic disease in the second line following a Cleopatra-like regimen, which has such an extraordinary overall survival benefit that that remains entrenched as the first line preferred option, even in 2020, unless patients have recently been exposed to the dual antibody combination, of course. So- What about the toxicity uh, of TDM1? and in comparison maybe to some of the other regimens. Exactly, I mean, uh, you know, of course with uh, TDM1, the most frequent adverse drug reactions uh, are going to be fatigue, nausea, muscle pain, thrombocytopenia, transaminase elevation, headache and constipation. All those have frequencies greater than 25% in the pivotal uh, Amelia clinical trial. And so one has to be mindful of those uh, potential adverse events and uh, there are dose modifications, of course, available in the prescribing information. So clinicians should refer to those uh, uh, religiously uh, to mitigate against these types of compl complications. I just want to add also that the response data that I mentioned from Amelia and from the Teresa trial um, were in patients who had never had pertuzumab for the most part in those studies, since these studies were done prior to the approval of pertuzumab in metastatic breast cancer. And consequently, uh, there has been more recent updated data looking at uh, a cohort of 77 patients published by our colleague from Italy, Dr. Conti. Uh, and, and that group was previously treated with pertuzumab and the TDM1 objective response rate in that cohort was 27%. Um, and nearly 40% continued on treatment for at least six months with disease under control. I think it's nice uh, that TDM1 does not cause a lot of alopecia, as opposed to a couple of our more recently approved antibody drug conjugates in breast cancer that do. 
you know, when we when we talk about options, and there are lots of options uh, for patients that haven't been head-on compared, so we don't know the correct order. I think you know, not losing your hair uh, would be important for some of our patients. Uh, I had a patient um, uh, who uh, had uh, a, a significant hepatotoxicity. Uh, have you um, with TDM1? And and I've used a lot of TDM1. This is rare. Uh, but it's been reported. Have you um, had any experience with that? I've seen one case. Actually, when I was giving a, a lecture in Asia, they presented a case to me of a patient with a, a rather acute onset of signs and symptoms of portal hypertension right. with no transaminase elevation. So this is a one syndrome that clinicians must be mindful of because it's so important and because it happens generally with, without transaminase elevation. So um, this, is, this condition is called nodular regenerative hyperplasia. The diagnosis can only be established by biopsy of the liver. So it's critical if you see a patient like that to get a liver biopsy, confirm the diagnosis, and then TDM1 is contraindicated thereafter. So that's a very important point. These are really uncommon, even rare. It's a rare syndrome, but uh, boy, if, if you see it, you really need to it's act. serious, yeah. And then, um, what excites you about some of the ongoing studies with TDM1 in metastatic breast cancer? You know, I, I think, you know, the most interesting ongoing trial, arguably, is perhaps the combination with uh, tocatinib. Um, and this has already reached a uh, phase three trial. It's tocatinib versus placebo in combination with TDM1. For patients with uh, HER2 positive advanced breast cancer, 460 patients will be enrolled. Uh, the study started in October of 2019, and the estimated primary completion date will be in April 2024. Uh, there had been a prior Phase 1b clinical trial of this combination uh, published by uh, Borges et al., and there was no PK interaction between these two drugs, and the full dose of tocatinib was feasible, although higher doses was not. Um, there was an expansion cohort of 50 patients, and 34 of those, that's 68%, treated with the maximum tolerated dose who had measurable disease and were valuable for response, had objective responses for a response rate of 47%. The median progression-free survival of that expansion cohort was about 8.2 months. So um, that's an interesting combination. If the pivotal trial is positive and if it's well tolerated, this could be a practice-changing uh, result to look forward to in the future, perhaps.